Good evening. It's time to begin our Bible study. Uh, could I ask you to bow with us for prayer as we begin tonight, please? Thank you, Father God, for a good day to serve you. Your word teaches us that this is the day the Lord has made, and we'll be glad and rejoice in it. Thank you that you have caused blessings to come our way and kept us within your care. We ask you now, Father, to reveal yourself to us through your word as we study tonight. We ask you that you prepare our hearts to receive and help us to be blessings one to another. May you be honored and glorified in all that we say and do, and for your blessings we'll give you our thanks. We ask with love and favor in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let me begin, and they say you're not supposed to, to begin with an apology. I thought I'd sent Brother Larry the PowerPoint for tonight, and he said he didn't get it, and so I probably didn't send it if he didn't get it. So uh, if you won't find the answers up there, but hopefully you do have a study guide. If you don't have a study guide, if you'll just uh, raise your hand or you'll see to it that you get one uh, for there. We're, uh, we're going to be studying about coats. Uh, from what I've seen tonight, the most of us have come in and had on some kind of a jacket, some kind of a coat. Well, what does the Bible say about coats? Uh, there are several scriptures that we'll deal with concerning coats uh, tonight uh, for, uh, for our thinking, for our study, for our time together. And you have the scriptures there that we'll be referring to. Now, don't, don't get the idea that I've memorized them. I haven't. My Bible is here, but I have them written in my notebook so that I don't have to keep flipping back and forth, Okay. Uh, but uh, that's for my benefit, and uh, I trust that you'll take your Bibles and look up the scriptures and follow along together. The first one is in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 19. And the scripture says, Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to the yearly sacrifice. Um, it's the story of Hannah, and it's a child's coat, a child's coat, and the person that it was made for was her prayed for son, Samuel. You'll remember the story how she had been to the temple to pray, and the priest thought she was inebriated, drunk, and, uh, wanted to downplay her for what uh, she was doing. And she told him she was asking God for a son. And he told her that request would be answered. And she said that, that uh, if God would give her a son, he would she would dedicate him to the Lord and he would be raised by Eli in the temple. Samuel was born and uh, brought to the temple to Eli and there Eli trained him. He was under the direction of Eli. And uh, in our scripture, it says that his mother made him a little coat every year, brought it with her to the, with her husband to the yearly sacrifice. Yearly sacrifice, that was the day of atonement. You'll remember that there were several feasts during the year. But the one special occasion, the, the yearly sacrifice that was so important to the Israelites, to the Jewish nation, was the Day of Atonement. That was the day the priest would offer a sacrifice and go into the Holy of Holies, the, go behind the veil and take the blood and sprinkle it on the uh, Ark of the Covenant there at the altar between the wings of the cherubims and they would make an offering for it. Well, Hannah and her husband would come for that yearly sacrifice and bring Samuel a jacket. Now, if Samuel was like our children were, just about every year he'd need another coat. Not because it would be worn out, but because he would have outgrown it. Can you imagine taking a child a coat for, say, a three-year-old and not taking him another coat until he was six years old. Uh, it'd be, maybe it would be a vest by then at, at the most, but uh, completely outgrown. 
But she did it on a yearly basis, an annual basis. That was her thing. Uh, sisters brought us a, a little crochet item. Up. That must be her thing to crochet. It was my mother's thing to crochet. Crochet pieces all over the house. But in the midst of doing it, there were certain things that she wanted to do for the children, for our family. And that was Hannah. That was Hannah saying, I'm going to do this because God gave me a son in Samuel, and I'm going to be every year taking him a coat, a child's coat, to Samuel for the yearly or at the yearly sacrifice. Number two, Genesis chapter 37 and verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. You've heard that story. It's a son's coat. And that son was Joseph. A son's coat. Joseph. Israel, his dad, would make him a coat of many colors. That would have been a colorful jacket, don't you suppose? <coughs> a coat of many colors. But notice what it says, that he made him a coat of many colors because he loved Jacob, or he loved Joseph, more than all of his children. Now, excuse me, I have a little bit of a parental problem with that that he showed favoritism to his child. A parent that shows favoritism is going to get himself, themselves in trouble as well as the child. And by doing it to Joseph, Joseph got in trouble because his brothers became jealous of him. Dad's made Joseph a coat of many colors. Never made me one. I never got a coat of many colors. And it was known that Jacob or Israel loved Joseph more than his brothers. Now, jealousy. Think with me the word jealousy. Let's spell it. J-E-A-L-O-U-S-Y. Jealousy. You there? You know what jealousy is? Look at the last five letters of that word. L-O-U-S-Y. Any idea what that spells? Lousy. Jealousy is lousy. To show favoritism in the family? I can't imagine saying to one of my girls, I love you more than the other. Now they'll tell each other, he loves me more. But they've never heard mom or dad say, I love you more than the other one does. And uh, I was just telling Sister Debbie that their birthday is tomorrow. They have the same birthday, four years apart. They make it easy on dad to remember birthdays. Uh, just the, the whole part from there. But jealousy. The brothers became so jealous of Joseph until they sold him into captivity. And then years later had to go to Egypt to buy corn and met their brother. And Joseph was kind enough to say, I don't hold it against you because God sent me before you to prepare the way, to be able to provide for you during this time of famine throughout the land. But Israel had made a coat, a son's coat, for Joseph. Number three, Exodus chapter 20, 28, verses 4 and 39. And these are the garments they shall make a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, and an embroidered coat. In verse 39, and thou shalt embroider the coat of fine linen. 
Number three is a priest's coat. It was a priest's coat. It would have been for Aaron first, the brother of Moses, who was the first priest of Israel. And in the midst of it, it had special instructions on how to make it. Embroider it with fine linen. In other words, there was not to be another coat made like that coat was made. It was the priest's coat. If there had been a shopping mall back then and men had gone in to buy suits of clothes, there would have been one section reserved for the priest's robe, his coat. And no one else could buy them. Only the priests could have those coats. It was separate for him because it was embroidered with fine linen. It was, it was to be so different until as it was embroidered and brought to the priests for their use in the sacrifices and in the anointings and all that would be taking place uh, in the priesthood in Israel, that coat would be different. It wasn't a run-of-the-mill, normal, active coat wear. It was reserved for the priests. It was a priest's coat. So, let me pause right here. Have we got one, two, and three? We're together, okay? A, a child's coat, a son's coat, a priest's coat. Number four, 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse five. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. Number four is a giant's coat. A giant's coat, that's Goliath. That little line underneath, Goliath. His armor, he had a helmet of brass, and he had a coat of brass that weighed 5,000 shekels of brass. Look that up in commentaries. And the weight of that brass armor would have been at least 150 pounds plus. It's not as helmet. It's not a shin guard, it's not a shoes, it's not a shield, it's not a spear, it's that body armor, 150 pounds. You say, that's too heavy, uh, Reverend Jones, for uh, someone to carry. Do you remember the size of Goliath? Have you ever, you ever thought about how big Goliath was? Nine feet, six inches. Nine feet, six inches. Can you imagine how tall nine feet, six inches is? Do any of you know about playing basketball or basketball? The basket on the basketball court is 10 feet high. That means Goliath was within six, feet, six inches of touching the rim on a basketball court, just standing underneath of it, making sure it was stretched and touching it was hit right there. I would imagine somebody that size could probably carry 150 pound weight, couldn't you? A big fellow. Now understand, he had an armor bearer that was taking his shield and the, the weaver beam spear, but to have that wrapped over his shoulders to cover his body, 150 Pound. Goliath taking 5,000 shekels of brass on the garment. Now, understand, the garment would be made in layers. It would be like, uh, say, tin or an alloy closest to his body. And then overlapping that would be 
it's sort of like laying shingles on your house. Over top of that, there would be layer row after row after row of shingles, layers of brass covering that, that on his body, 150 pounds worth, a giant's coat. Uh, when I was uh, working for the power company, uh, I had to wear a green uniform. And uh, one day I was working in this area where my sister taught school. And I said to her, I'll come by and have lunch with you. What time do you have lunch? And she told me. So I got to the school and uh, went to her classroom. And she said to her students, boys and girls, I'd like to introduce you to my little brother. I'm the baby of the family. She said, I'd like to introduce you to my little brother, my baby brother. And I had on a green shirt and one of the students looked up and said, little brother said he looks like a green giant to me. And I imagine to a seven or eight year old at my size, that might would look true. Hello? But can, can I tell you that if I were to meet Goliath, we couldn't meet face to face. It'd be like, oh yeah, uh-huh, sure, right. Hello up there, kind of deal. And if he's looking at me, he would say, are you still there? Uh, are you here? Is it any wonder he would threaten when David came to him, you think I'm a dog that you'd send out a child to do a man's job? And David said, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Took out a stone, put it in his sling, wound it up, fired it away, got on God's GPS system and embedded in Goliath's forehead. And Goliath fell to the ground. Why? Because the coat of mail that he had was not sufficient to provide when God was going to strike him and bring victory to the Israelites. Understand, without the right garment, you're defenseless. Everyone would have thought that Goliath was too big to fall. I would imagine Joseph's brother, or Samuel's brothers would have said something like this, Joseph, he's too big for you to go against. And Joseph would say to them, He's too big for me to miss. I, I could almost hit him blindfolded, you know, apart from there. Sometimes we look at our problems and say, oh, Lord, they're too big for us to deal with. But when we see it from God's point of view, they're too big for us not to conquer. They're the right size for us to win the victory over. Why? Because he provides for us those things we stand in need of. Number four, a giant's coat. Number five. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 32. 2 Samuel 15, 32. It came to pass that when David was come to the top of the mount where he worshiped God, behold, Hushai, the archite, came to meet him with his coat rent and earth upon his head. Number five is a rent, R-E-N-T, a rent coat. Or Remember, Jones, what does that, what do you mean a rent coat? That Hushai came to David and his coat was rent. Well, let's look at some of the history. David's son Absalom was trying to usurp the kingdom. He wanted to overthrow his father David and become the king of Israel. And David was having a difficulty trying to hold Israel together and fight his son at the same time. Absalom was just trying to take over his father's throne. And David was trying to bring peace. And his servant, Hushai, came to David. And did you read it? Did you hear it read? And his coat was rent. What does it mean having a torn coat? Well, it wasn't something that he'd been out working and snagged it. It wasn't he'd been in a battle and someone had torn it. A red coat was a sign of, and get this, it was a sign of allegiance. It was a sign that Hushai was saying to David, I am committed to being your servant 
to do what you want me to do and to do it for the good of our nation, the good of our people, and to bless you. Allegiance. Well, you don't hear that word too often, do we? About the only time you hear it in America is when some will stand and say, I pledge allegiance, and others don't like to do that. They'll take a knee. I'm glad to say I'm glad I'm an American tonight, amen? I'm glad to live in a country that I can go to church, uh, not just on Sunday, but in the middle of the week. I'm glad I live in a country where I can still read my Bible, and I can still pray, and I can still trust God. And I thank God that because of doing that, I can show him my allegiance. I'm committed to him. And that's what the child would say. I'm committed to you, David. Whatever you want me to do, I'll be willing to do it. That's allegiance. And what? I said that about Hushai and David. As we claim our allegiance to God, we should be saying to him, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll be what you want me to be. I am available. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Most of us say, Lord, I don't have much to offer him. He knows that. But he still wants us to follow him. And he still wants us to show allegiance to him. A dull-minded person is of no benefit. And say, well, I believe this, and then to live a different lifestyle. You can't get good and bad water out of the same well. Either we're showing our allegiance to Christ, or we're not. We're either his children, or we're not. We're either on our way to heaven, or we're not. Well, pastor, I go to church. I, I read my Bible. I pray. It's more than that tonight, church, and you understand that. The Bible says, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. It takes a salvation experience in order to get allegiance to the Lord. That's where allegiance comes from, that we're willing to commit ourselves to him to be whatever he wants us to be. And that's the coat that's rent. Lord, it's no longer me. It's no longer my trying to live my life the way I want to live. It's here I am, Lord, use me. It's that allegiance. It's that writ coat. Number six, John chapter 19, verses 23 and 24. Then the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. <clears throat> now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my garments among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. There was a coat that Jesus wore, that robe, that was without a seam. I tried to listen while I was driving. Gloria and Miss Joan were talking about their sewing experiences on the way to church tonight. And I wanted so bad to say, have you ever sewn something that you didn't have a seam in? In other words, you simply cut it out like it belonged to me and handed it to him and said, here, wear this. Now, I cannot imagine what it would have been had I been doing it. I would have taken a sheet folded it just right, cut a hole in the middle of it, go over your head, and there it would have been. And you got it. No, his was sewn without a seam in it. It was put together, cut in such a way that there was no seam in it. When he was crucified, for his vesture they cast lots. But when it came to that coat, that robe, seamless, they would not rend it. They would not tear it apart. They said, let's cast lots for it to see who gets it. The Bible doesn't tell us who won. The Bible doesn't tell us who got the cut. The Bible doesn't say whatever happened to the cut. 
But can you imagine the soldier that got the coat? And this is what I love about scripture. Can you imagine the soldier that got the coat when he got home that afternoon and he's got a coat stinging over his arm and it's blood splattered and his wife says to him, what's that? And he says, it's the coat of the man we crucified today. Well, why did you bring that home? There's something different about that man. When he died, the sun refused to shine. When he died, there was an earthquake. When he died, even the other guards who were standing by his side said, surely this was the son of God. There was something different about him. And this is the coat he wore. The son's coat, the redeemer's coat, the son of God. Number six is the redeemer, the redeemer's coat. And it belonged to Jesus Christ. It was given to someone gambling for his garment because he was dying to save you and me from our sins. Number seven, John chapter 21 and verse seven. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, and that's referring to John. Uh, let me pause right there. When you're reading the Gospel of John, he never refers to himself as John. He never says, Jesus said to me, or Jesus said to John the disciple. He always says, that disciple whom Jesus loved. He wasn't saying that Jesus loved him more than he did others. He was just recognizing the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for him. He says, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and he cast himself into the sea. Number seven is a fisherman's coat. A fisherman's coat. Peter and the disciples had been fishing throughout the night. And Jesus shows up on the shore. Have you caught anything? No. Casting it on the other side. They did. They catch a great draft of fishes. And John says to Peter, that's the Lord. And when Peter heard John say, it's the Lord, he gets his fisherman's coat because he was naked, dove into the water and came to shore. And when he got to shore, Jesus has got bread and fish on the fire. You ever try to read between the lines of somebody's letter? Questions. Where did Jesus get the wood? Where did Jesus get the fish? Did he just stand at the shore and say, I need some fish and a school of fish just come swimming to shore and kamikaze up on the shoreline and him clean them and put them on the fire? Don't know. But it's not pertinent to our salvation. It's just that when Peter got there, Jesus had fish on the fire. Bread and fish to give. Peter had a fisherman's coat. I was maybe 10 years old or maybe 11. And my uncle came to live with us for a while. He was My dad was buying another barbershop. And my uncle came to live with us and run that barbershop. And one night he said to my mother, his who was his sister, let him go fishing with me. Okay. So we went down to a, a pier down at the end of our community, probably 800 feet long or so, and we're out there fishing. And Uncle Pim says to me, son, uh, here's some money. Why don't you go up to the snack bar and get us a soda and a pack of nabs? I said, okay. So I took his money and I went walking up to the shoreline to the end of the pier, got ready to order sodas and a snack, and I heard a crack of thunder. I'll just wait a minute, he'll be here in a minute. And so I just stood there waiting. Sky got dark, thunder, 
I mean, it was thundering. I looked out the, down the pier, and everybody was coming off the pier. Oh, Uncle Pim will be here in a minute. I looked, and Uncle Pim wasn't coming. He reached in his tackle box, pulled out a raincoat with a hoodie on it, put that raincoat on, picked up his fishing line, and threw it back in the water. I'm standing there watching him. Somebody said, who's that dummy out there fishing in this kind of weather? You think I told him that was my uncle? <laughs> no, thank you. But about that time, while everyone was still watching him, his rod went, he caught something, and he pulled in one of the nicest fish. I believe it may have been a bluefin. I don't remember what it was. Anyway, he pulled in the nice sized fish. He caught something. It's pouring down rain and thundering, and him out there fishing. What's that dummy doing? Oh, he's just out there fishing, putting it in his in his uh, cooler. Take home with him. What about about? Oh, just a few minutes, the rain stopped and the sun came back out. Everybody went back out fishing and I got the sodas and the snacks and started back out. When I got to where Uncle Pim was, people were about that close to him. If he'd have slung this, this way to throw his line out, he'd have took somebody's face off right there. Boom. Come back this way to cast his line. Everybody was close to it. It didn't take but just a couple of minutes that lines were crisscrossed and tangled all up. And him saying, we may as well go home now. These people think this is the only place on this pier to fish. But we didn't. They couldn't catch the thing with the lines all tangled up, so they all finally dispersed and he kept on fishing. And we enjoyed it. But he had a fisherman's coat. Now, when I see he had a fisherman's coat, it was just a regular rain gear with a hoodie on. But he didn't take it to the barbershop. He didn't take it with him on vacation unless he had his tackle box. The coat was always kept in his tackle box. And I would say, I would wonder, why is his coat always there? Because if it ever started raining while he was fishing, he'd come prepared. And when Peter heard that, heard John say that it was Jesus on the shore, he covered his nakedness, dove into the water, and came to shore and met with Jesus. A fisherman's coat. A fisherman's coat. Now, You've heard me say it before, that sometimes in messages, I will make the statement, you've been set up. You've heard that before? You've been set up. Why? Because Jesus said to his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And when we follow him and become fishers of men, he puts on us the fisherman's coat. And we put that fisherman's coat on because no matter where we are or who we're with, my brother, we have the opportunity to witness about the Lord Jesus Christ. To tell somebody that God loves them enough that he gave his only begotten son. That they can find peace and forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. The gentleman that spoke at the men's breakfast Sunday morning when the service was over, he had talked about accepting people as they are, trying to make them different. And I said to him, just want to give you one statement. It's our responsibility to catch them. It's his responsibility to clean them. If you and I try to get people cleaned up before they can come to Jesus, we're barking up the wrong tree. But if we'll bring people to Jesus, he'll clean them up. All we've got to do is put on our fisherman's coat, go fishing for lost souls, bring them to Jesus Christ, and watch him clean them up and get them ready for heaven. Coats. I heard.
heard that it's supposed to go down to freezing tonight. So before we left the house, my wife made sure you got your coat. Don't don't forget your coat. I don't need a coat. I got a long sleeve shirt. The car will be warm. The church will be warm. Get your coat. So I'm just quoting my wife tonight. Make sure you got your coat on. I don't mean because it's cold outside, but because we've got to be busy about our Father's business. Would you bow together with me, please? Thank you, Father God, for the opportunity to study your word. Thank you for coats in the Bible. Thank you for their meaning. Thank you for their truths. Help us, Lord, to find ourselves wearing the fisherman's coat to bring others to you. A child's coat because we're children of the Most High God. A son's coat because we are your sons, your daughters. A priest's coat because we're called to be priests to this generation. Help us, Father, to put on these coats because you care for each life. Keep us, Lord, within your care until we meet together again and may you be honored and glorified in our lives. And for all that you provide, we'll give you our thanks. We ask with love and favor in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy being with you. Amen.